it looks as though we are live on our Facebook page. And um, I am here today with my friend Darby Strickland, um, who I love, 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 love. Okay. <laughs> Just be, I love your work. I, um, I love your heart. And um, I have been so encouraged um, by you and, and what you've been doing. And recently, Darby wrote a, an amazing book, really more for people helpers, but it's called Is It Abuse? Um, subtitle, A Biblical Guide to Identifying Domestic Abuse and Helping Victims. Um, I used to actually recommend a secular book um, to people who wanted to understand the dynamics of domestic abuse. And now, Darby, um, this book, I think, has replaced it for me. So I'm, I'm really um, happy about your work. It just came out. It was released September 16th yeah, yeah. and sold out right away. So do you know if it's even available right now? Yeah, Westminster Books has it at half price. And wow. Amazon, I think, will have it to ship next week. So. Okay, yeah. So you can order it and it will come. Uh, you, maybe at some point they'll put it on Kindle like I did mine. It is on Kindle. It's already on Kindle. See, that's it. Get it today. <laughs> and I think that's really important too for those of us who, are, especially ones who are still in situations, to have it on Kindle so it's not sitting out where somebody can find it. But again, this one to me is really a good one if... It's more like a, a reference book and it really has a lot of good information. So um, today, um, Darby agreed to do this interview with me because it's Domestic Violence Awareness Month and we are going live at Call to Peace Ministries every week um, on our Facebook page just to help raise awareness. And so she was asking me, what are we gonna talk about? And I thought we could just talk about several chapters here in your book. Um, one I want to get to is spiritual abuse, but first um, I would like to just mention the reason that we're doing this is that domestic abuse is one of those issues that is so, uh, well, as my friend Dr. Deborah Wingfield says, it's counterintuitive. It, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't respond well to what we, especially you and I are both biblical counselors, it doesn't respond well to the kind of counseling that we want to do. We a lot of times think, well, we just need to do some marital counseling or they need this and that, but truly what they um, really need is, you know, to be pulled ap to apart from one another and work on individual issues. And we need to hold the abuser accountable for his abuse. Um, generally speaking, it's a he. And so um, today, I think what I wanna do is just talk about the, the various obstacles that victims of domestic abuse um, face. We defined what domestic abuse looks like. Last week I had Julie Owens on and we talked about it being a pattern um, of control and, and oppression really. And I would love for you to just give it to and for more from a biblical per, um, definition. Give, give us how you would define domestic abuse and I'm going to turn off my camera for a second while you do that. Sure. I tend to use the category, the biblical category of oppression um, because I feel like it captures the domination that's involved when um, your spouse is oppressing you. Um, it's, it's, you're living in a climate of coercive control um, where you're being um, dominated in a way to serve. You're actually enslaved um, to meet someone else's um, whims, desires, wishes, preferences, entitlements. And when you fail to serve them in that way, or you're enslaved in that way, you face punishments of all sorts of horrible kinds. And so another category you could think about in the church would be the good king, the bad king, right? Just being enslaved to somebody else who wants to build their own kingdom versus being married to somebody who wants to serve the Lord and to love their spouse well. Yeah. And um, I love that you mentioned coercive control. So I actually, when I came out of the, my own uh, domestic abuse situation, one of the things that I kept doing is going to counselors and nobody understood what was going on. And, and finally, I ended up in a program that understood domestic abuse. I saw a power and control wheel. Mm -hmm. That is the first time that I was even willing to admit that my relationship was abusive. At this point, he had had his hands around my throat. He had had a knife at my neck. There had been all sorts of things that happened, but it didn't happen every day. And it, it, we could go years in between. Yeah. So I didn't see it as domestic violence or what they would call it back then was battering. So I imagined it had to be pounding every day. And so 
I had to have somebody define it for me. And I find that I know you see that, but what has happened now with the, the secular world, they've started changing the terminology because we used to call it domestic violence. That sounds like it has to be physical. Mm -hmm. And um, coercive control really defines it better, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I would agree. There's so many different quadrants you can be controlled in and that's why that power and control will is so effective because mm -hmm. it can be your reproduction it could be your sexual relationship it could be finances there's just so many areas of when you share a life with someone where you can be controlled yeah so that's our goal in um october at cult abuse ministries we want to help raise awareness we want people to understand what domestic abuse looks like and I'm going to, I told you, I'll get in trouble if I don't mention to you that at Call to Peace, we are having a fundraiser because our ministry, um, we get about 150 calls a month from people who are struggling with domestic abuse. About two thirds of those calls come from survivors or victims, currently victims or people who've gotten out and still need help. And then about another third come from people helpers, counselors, pastors, um, friends and family. And so we... Um, to have moved from 50 calls a month last year at this time to 150 is overwhelming. And so we're just asking if you would share in our um, vision to be able to come alongside, not only to help victims and survivors, but to help people helpers, to come alongside churches, because that's part of what we do is we go in and we actually help churches. We have several local churches we've helped, but we've helped churches across the country. And so, um, going to let you comment on that if you have anything you'd yeah, like. Yeah, no, I think that's just so important because we all know people who follow you know you do this well and you train people helpers well. And if we were going to invest money in someone who could replicate and exponentially train people, because every time you train someone and send them out, they're going to train other people and send them out. And I think it just speaks well to the need that you're seeing is increasing because you, you serve people well. So why not? Why wouldn't we want you to hire more people who could train more people? <laughs> it's like, please, Lord, do it. Yeah. yeah. We, I, we actually have a one-year advocacy training with Dr. Deborah Wingfield. And she, um, I mean, it's heavy duty. It's loaded with research. And uh, I love it because I've learned quite a bit myself. But And so we have the, the people who graduate from that class, a lot of times will volunteer and advocate for people. So we, I know that we had about 45 finished last year's training. We had, um, I gosh, over a hundred that were signed up for this year, but total about 200 people who've taken at least one of our courses. And um, Dr. Deborah will be on here next week. We'll talk more about that. But um, even with folks volunteering, a lot of our um, advocates are survivors and they need an income. So we are you know, really trying to be able to compensate some of the people who are doing this more so than others, maybe one case at a time. So that's part of the reason we're doing this. So let's talk a little bit about um, obstacles that uh, survivors, uh, victims of domestic abuse face. Um, we will be talking about the legal challenges next week with Dr. Deborah and Tiffany Lesnick, who's an, a family law attorney on our board. But we, let's talk about some of the other things that you've seen. Um, it seems like that I know coming out of it, I felt like everywhere I went, I was just hitting my head up against the brick wall. I could not find the help I needed. And one of the areas I think is counseling. So talk a little bit about that. You as a counselor, from a counseling perspective, what have you said? Yeah, certainly. I think, I think of even early on in my own counseling, I had victims of domestic violence sitting in front of me and I didn't recognize that I had a victim. Um, and so one is even a counselor even recognizing that um, the marriage in front of them, there is coercive control happening or that there has been abuse past or present. I know early on, I didn't ask certain questions, so it just wasn't revealed to me. Um, and things would get stuck in counseling and maybe it would take me a year to learn, um, which is just, it's grievous. So part of it is you have a victim who's going to a people helper, whether it's a friend or a counselor, and they are, they're not aware that what they're facing is abuse. The second really, biggest obstacle is when you are asking for help. There's so many relational um, issues between the couple or complex over certain issues. And so counselors often and people helpers, friends want to get in there and mediate disagreements. Um, and they, they're prioritizing unity in the relationship or even the marriage. 
because they're missing that when abuse is involved that the, our priority has to be safety. Um, and so if even just identifying a counselor who is aware of what they should be prioritizing in the counseling is a big obstacle because you can't, you just put a victim in much more harm and she's, she's earnestly trying to help her marriage. She'll do all sorts of things that you're telling her to do, but it'll really harm her if you're not prioritizing her safety. Mm. So those are the two largest I see in the counseling and then trying to advocate for somebody's safety, whether it's with their church Oftentimes the church, it takes them some time to get in step, to believe what's being presented, to know how to help. They feel overwhelmed if they believe it. Um, and sometimes there's just a lag in people seeing what you see. Yeah. And I'll say too, that when I first started doing this work, after getting out, I said, Lord, if you help me survive, I'll help other women in these situations. And he's kind of held me to it. <laughs> but I remember every time from the very first case that I started working with the pastor, when she came to him, she, he believed her. Mm -hmm. And then he heard the other side of the story and he goes, you know, it's just too hard to tell what's going on in these situations. He said, you do what you want to do, but the church is bowing out. Mm -hmm. so I've seen that. And I've seen them say, no, you didn't hear his side of the story and she's making it up. And that was what was really shocking to me that in probably 90 to 95% of the cases I dealt with in the beginning, 20 some years ago, they weren't believed. The victims were not believed. And um, so I know that you've probably seen that as well. Yeah. Thankfully not with the same percentage, because I do think the church is learning. Yes. Uh, from ministries like yours and resources that you and others have written. Um, but it is true. So I think one of the things I tried to even do in that book that I wrote is to make it a manual was to help a people helper um, present a story of abuse by just having questions and worksheets so they could go with a more organized story saying this is a whole pattern of course of control that's happening in the relationship. It's hard to organize a story of abuse and present it to people who have to make decisions um, in leadership and churches because the stories are confusing. Victims are confused. Um, things always seem upside down. Um, oppressors are great at taking people in misdirection. They're fantastic at misdirection and blame shifting. Mm -hmm. So one thing I think is just helping somebody organize their story in such a way that it may, it's comprehensive and it makes sense. It, it demonstrates not five instances, but the hundred that they lived through. Yeah. One thing that was helpful to me was to learn, um, I was reading a manual um, and, and, our, and Julie Owens worked out at the National Center for PTSD Studies. And one thing they discovered was that probably the largest population of PTSD survivors in the, in the world, definitely in the United States, are domestic violence survivors. So we're looking at people, it's almost like they've been through war. I know that I had, I was extremely um, hyper vigilant. I had nightmares, all the, all the signs of PTSD, but to, to understand that whether or not there's been physical abuse, 80, over 80% 80 of domestic abuse survivors, meaning anybody under coercive control, it doesn't have to have been violent, suffer from a form of PTSD. We call it more complex PTSD these days because it's over a long period of time rather than a one-time event. But, um, and so that's one of the reasons that victims, survivors do not present as well. And so it can be very confusing. And so if you have um, some counselors here that you would like to speak to and say, what do you do to break through that confusion? I say you really just want to go slow. So if there's something you don't understand, don't dismiss it. Sit, ask more questions, draw somebody out, um, take more time. Um, if things don't add up, um, or you're seeing a, someone who's talking to you, they're confused or their story's circular. Be really curious about that. Um, oftentimes I think when we don't understand something, we tend to lean toward ju judgment um, versus leaning towards somebody and learning their story. And I think trauma victims of all kinds and domestic abuse trauma victims really need us to learn from them what they've endured. And so if you're a learner of their story, you're gonna be in a really good position. Um, I know in the book, I talk about different wounds that trauma causes, you know, like you were saying, the hypervigilance, the faith questions, um, emotional reactions. So you just want to be alert to those things. And, you know, if you're seeing, again, patterns of behavior, um, nervousness, self-doubt, profound guilt, 
make those things make you more curious about a person and elicit more of their story. Yeah, that's good. And so, um, yes, taking time to enter in. I just, I believe that's Jesus's heart. That's why I love you so much because you listen, you go, wait, this isn't right. We've got a, a guy on our board, Jim up church, and he's a pastor and a woman came to him and he did exactly what you're saying. Um, she was in a situation and he thought that doesn't sound right. And so he was, tr- he started in the beginning trying to do marital counseling. And he thought well, this, he, this guy is using my counsel against her. So that's not working. Right. And he just started doing more and more research. And finally he found something on domestic abuse and he goes like, is this what's happening to you? <laughs> yeah. That is entering into somebody's pain to understand really what's going on. Yeah. Um, so I think that's what the Lord asks of us, right? It is, yeah. it is more painful. It requires more patience. We don't, as helpers, we don't like to feel like we don't know or understand, yeah. right? We want to feel competent, but I think we just have to recognize we're dependent people who depend upon the Lord, uh, who's patient with us. He's highly repetitive, with, you know, in scripture, and yeah. we just need to be more like him. Um, and, and just aware of it's okay. It's okay that we're, we don't know something. We just need to seek to learn it. Yeah. And I think too, knowing our God's heart, um, is, is always for the oppressed. Mm -hmm. Um, so if there's any inkling of oppression, you know, when I look at the old Testament and every time I read through the old Testament and I see God's judgment is about to fall on his people, it's usually, there's usually oppression mis- mentioned in there, injustice, a lack of uh, justice, pr- oppression, um, you know, basically hurting people um, in, in the name of religion even. Yeah, and yeah. So that, will, that was a good transition. I didn't even plan it, but uh, <laughs> we were going to talk about one of the other obstacles for uh, victims of abuse is uh, spiritual abuse. And so I was, I mentioned to you before we turned on the, um, the, the recording or we came on to Facebook that in 2018, Call to Peace Ministries did a survey of almost 200 Christian survivors of domestic abuse. And we asked them, did your partner uh, or did your husband serve in ministry and 29.8 percent so almost a third of them said that their husband served in ministry in some capacity about 22 percent of them actually had um, gone to seminary had seminary training so that was a big shocker to me because my ex-husband was not uh, he was not in ministry and I thought well you know certainly it was because he was just a nominal Christian but mm-hmm. we see it all the time so um, I, I caught you now are you eating <laughs> <laughs> no sorry I had a cough so I muted my I don't want you to cough <laughs> <laughs> I think of the tickles gone we'll hope so out. anyway chapter nine in your book is um is wonderful I don't know that many resources that cover spiritual abuse very well and so you gave a definition like a biblical uh, I think a v- very biblical definition of what spiritual abuse looks like. Can you tell us a little sure, bit? Sure, sure. So if a husband and um, exhibits control-oriented leadership over his wife, lords his power over her, demands submission, or uses scripture in daily life or in conflicts together in shaming and punishing ways, and I think that's key, those are signs of spiritual abuse. So when you have somebody who's twisting scripture and using it to attack their wife, right, um, that's grievous because not only is the, is the victim being abused, but God's words are being used. And victims can be very confused and think um, that those shames and attacks are coming from the Lord himself. Even if scripture is taken out of context, even though it's distorted and weaponize it, it's God's words. Um, and so oftentimes victims feel like so much shame, so much guilt, because they feel like God is against them and almost that they deserve the abuse. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say that the, the two, um, I guess the, the most common outcomes with any kind of abuse are spiritual outcomes. Uh, we do not know who God, who God is, or we don't know his heart for us. I, re- I remember, I would not have voiced it because I was like mm-hmm. leading things in church. I was very, very faithful to my church. But I thought, God, you love marriage um, and, and you're not saving my marriage. And so really d- deep down inside, I started questioning his goodness. Mm-hmm. So we start questioning God's goodness. And the second um, outcome I think is, I know, is that we don't know who we are in Christ because I'm allowing somebody to treat me 
uh, terribly. I don't think God wants his children treated the way I was being treated for sure. I know he doesn't. And when so you, when people begin to believe what they're told about themselves. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so sure. if you feel unworthy and unworthy of the Lord, you're cut off from him when you need him the most. Yeah. And it's, you know, we know that we see abusers, you use isolation in relationships. I think if we often forget that in spiritual abuse, an abuser is often isolating the person from the Lord as well. He's cutting off the ability for someone to relate to them. Yeah. Yeah. And that is so contrary to God's heart for us. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of um, comments and hey, Christine Chapel's watching. She says hi to both of us. <laughs> and um, Julie says, um, my biblical counselor did not believe me when I confusedly tried to tell him my husband was using um, his marital counsel against me. And Darby, I hope that you read this because, um, well, you might remember the situation, so I shouldn't be reading that out loud, but um, I cannot begin to describe the secondary trauma. And that's what so many have told me is that when their counselors don't get it, when their pastors don't get it, it's like a whole new level of trauma because you're thinking, but these are the ones that are supposed to help. I understand that my husband's abusive, but why aren't they getting it? We're just so confused and, and bewildered. And then again, like you said, start wondering, where are you in this, God? Where are you? Um, somebody else says, yeah, marital counseling is not <clears throat> recommended. Absolutely. It will usually make things worse. And so we, we talk about that in some of our other videos. Um, so uh, then it talks about the spiritual abuse of the Pharisees. I have often thought when I read the, the New Testament, I always think when I'm reading the way Jesus um, interacts with the Pharisees, boy, they were just like an abuse. They're, they were abusers, clearly, because they had him put on a cross eventually. <laughs> so, but let's talk about that, the dynamic and, the, and what we see in an abusive personality that really mirrors what you see in the Pharisees and other places in scripture. I think the Pharisees, right, they preached one, a set of law that they themselves didn't follow. Right. And we know that abusers perpetually make rules for other people to follow. They also um, focused on the minors. Right. And, and and just were cruel about distorting the wrong parts of God's law. Um, they weren't about making God's people closer um, to them. They were create they were actually creating that division in the relationship between the Lord and his people. And that's just grievous that just. Jesus was so upset with them for the damage that they were doing to his people and creating a distance and a barrier to them seeing God and God's love for his people um, that, you know, he just pronounced those woes um, pretty sternly in scripture like saying this is disgusting um, and harsh and he had some hard things to say. Yes, he did. You're a little snakes, whitewashed tombs, vibrant. Yes. yes. <laughs> some mild words. Yeah, we saw the damage that they were doing mm -hmm. and the damage was concerning. Yeah. 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 So once again, I just truly believe that this ministry is God's heart. And I'm so grateful. Another reason I'm grateful for you, um, for our friend, Chris Moles and, um, and the other, we all are part of a group that talks about this subject about once a month. And um, the church is waking, waking up to it. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, let's talk a bit, little bit about some success stories. How about that? With churches, <laughs> see when a church gets it right, what a difference they can make in the life of somebody who's been oppressed. And I say, and the person watching in the pew, I think that's what I've been. My pastor, um, my new pastor's come in, he's handled abuse cases well. And um, Sadly, that's increased his burden because one after another, after another, after another. But it's a testimony to the elders and the pastors loving their people well, is that a victim will watch a church and know that they can be protected and believed, and then the next one comes forward. So in a sense, it's a beautiful blessing when a church does it well, but it's also more difficult on the church because like you're saying, you've seen people in your ministry, right? You have three times the the amount because you have the reputation and it's going to be the same in the local church. And so, yeah. We just had a, a local church here started domestic abuse ministry. And he said, well, you know, the first week we already had five people call us. And then, uh, and then a the month later, we had 12 more people call us. <laughs> and I remember just trying to tell my church years ago, this is, uh, you've got domestic violence in your church. No, we don't have it. We don't have it here. <laughs> 
Yes, you do. But the but the victims are waiting to see if they can trust you with their stories. Yeah. Because if you handle it the wrong way, you're going to get them in worse uh, trouble at right, home. We all know that the cases aren't going to go well, right? Oppressors are going to complain. There's going th things are going to be difficult. Um, separations can lead to divorce. Also, you know, there's so, a victim's circumstances are going to get worse um, as the oppression comes to light, right? So. Mm -hmm. So she has to be supported in that. And, it, and it's gonna be difficult for the church to navigate because it's not, these things aren't easy to navigate. Yeah, well, they're just, they're just downright messy. So mm -hmm. let's talk about that because of the multiple, multiple um, barriers that victims face. We know, and we'll talk about this if you guys tune in next Thursday at the same time, we're gonna talk about legal barriers because we know that the courts don't understand domestic abuse when it comes, it's not just, we're not here to even say, you counselors don't get it, you pastors don't get it. Nobody gets it, even us victims don't get it. So we're not here to, to put you down or to make you feel bad. We're here to say, there's a huge learning curve when it comes to domestic abuse. And so, um, but I, I know that you've probably seen situations that just with multiple complications. And I know we talked a little bit about thinking of somebody, I've got somebody in mind, but if you've got somebody, you want to tell us a little sure, bit. Yeah, I'm just thinking of a woman I counseled for probably two years initially, and she was married to an asso associate pastor. Um, she knew that coming forward, not only she wondered would she be believed because he was really influential in the church. His public image um, was pristine. You know, he would be praying with everyone else's wife and families. Um, so she faced the barrier of being believed in a different way. Um, but she also knew that if she came forward um, in this particular case, her husband would lose her, his job. I see that also with military wives, right, sometimes. Um, or people with, they, they know if they call because and they were beaten, um, they call the police, their husband will lose their job. Um, so there's the barrier to the direct impact um, if they have to get separated, right? When, when she did, she had small children. She had to figure out how to work. She never had children in a daycare situation. The husband wouldn't agree to one to make it difficult for her to get a job. Um, so it just, one, I think I do a support group um, for women in my church. And I would say every other week we face, we look at some insurmountable problem that somebody's facing that it's just it's heartbreaking and a few weeks later we see how the lord and help has overcome it through time but we forget asking for help bringing these things into the light means they have, victims have to have so much faith that god can rescue yeah. because there's obstacles everywhere there's big ones and there's small ones yeah i do remember when i first started the ministry and i was working with somebody and i just went lord this is impossible what have